Okay, let's get started. I guess you're ready for the Easter break. That's our last lecture. Good, we still have a reasonably crowded room. Okay, we'll continue on microprogramming. Everybody remembers microprogramming now? Yes. Who, who filled out the full microcode for LC3B? No one? <laughs> no one is that ambitious? It's fun to do it, you know. Remember, <laughs> you know, remember we filled out a few states. I think four states. That's one-eighth of the machine. So 12.5% of the microcode is gone. The rest is not that hard, actually. One state is exactly the same as one of these. So five out of 32 is gone. Anyway. So you don't need to do it. It's not an assignment. But if you have interest, this is one of the best ways to learn how to microprogram. Okay, uh, we're here. We're going to finish up microprogrammed microarchitectures and then go into pipelining. Let's see if we can finish pipelining uh, today, at least, at least the basics of it. And keep reading, chapter 7.5. Basically, I'll assign you the rest of the chapter uh, and we'll cover some things from there. Remember, th this is what we were, we were doing, basically. I'm going to flash these slides to jog your memory. Basically, we were looking at a micro microprogram data path, which is relatively minimalistic. It's always good when you, when you design or teach, it's always good to think about the minimal thing that you're doing. If you can get away with a minimal solution that satisfies your requirements, that's good. Now, this is not the best possible you can get in terms of minimalism, because as we saw on the data path over here, there are a bunch of ALUs. You could actually have minimized them, but then that would have made something else more complex, right? as we've discussed last time. And this is the finite state machine. Uh, this is the data path. This is the exercise we were doing. And we did four of these states over here. And the rest you can do. Or if you have questions, you can come and ask me or the TAs or your peers. And you can figure out together to microprogram a machine. But I would definitely encourage you to think about this uh, going forward, because uh, this is important. And you will see why it's even more important uh, today. In a little bit. OK, we have looked at the control signals. This is basically, it's a simple design of the control structure. That's what microprogramming enables you. Because your microprogram, all of your control signals, except those that need to be generated based on what's going on in the data path at the moment, are stored in this control store. And you have a nice microsequencer. And this is, the, uh, my, my, this is basically the definition of your state at this point all of the control signals associated with your state. And this is the microsequencer. Of course, microsequencer design depends on the state machine, right, clearly. And this is a nice microsequencer because it's relatively minimal again, right? You could make this microsequencer much more complicated. Uh, it's, it's basically logic. You can have a logically equivalent microsequencer that's much more complicated, right? And this is what I showed you just now. OK, we're done with the exercise in microprogramming. I'm not going to revisit that again. Uh, but if you have questions, uh, let us know. Uh, variable latency memory, I mentioned this earlier, but I'd like to mention this again. Basically, remember we had this ready signal that enables memory read write to execute correctly. That transition from state 33 to state 35 in the finite state machine, that's basically a memory read state whose control signals we actually filled out. I know you guys cannot see it, unfortunately, but this is when you're fetching the 30, state 33 is where you're actually accessing memory. And whether the memory is ready or not determines whether you stay in state 33 or you go to state 35, basically. You don't need to see it, but you understand what this means over here, basically. But this is determined based on the arbit asserted. The question is, could we have done this in a single cycle microarchitecture? And by definition, no, because single cycle means single cycle. You're not waiting multiple cycles, right? You can still have the ready signal in a single cycle microarchitecture, but your cycle time gets extended until that ready signal becomes available. Right. Still, uh, if I didn't harp on uh, the single cycle microarchitecture enough, I'll keep on doing that, and you'll see more of that. Uh, okay, we'll get back to actually one of the one of the questions one of you asked uh, earlier: What did we assume about me memory and registers in a single cycle microarchitecture? Uh, basically, when you read the register file, it's really a combinational read. Right? The, the clock 
going into the registry file doesn't affect your read. We assume that you combinationally read the register file and get the data out of it. And when you write to the register file, that write happens at the end of the clock cycle. That's, uh, that's what enables a single cycle microarchitecture to work correctly. If it happens during the clock cycle, if things change during that time, that's not good because you're still reading from it within that single cycle, right? So you depend on that uh, write happening at the end of the clock cycle. Okay, so there are some advanced questions. I'm not going to answer all of these, actually, but these are fun questions. Uh, for example, what if your machine gets interrupted? Uh, I'd like to be able to switch between these two uh, relatively quickly. So if you have a micro microprogrammed machine, okay. Okay, that's not bad, except I want to change the orientation. How do I change the orientation, you think? Uh, this is one way. Not that great. <laughs> so there's a solution, but that's not the solution to our problem. Uh, let's see, external menu. Do you guys see anything? Okay, no external menu. Focus, presets. Okay, anyway, I'll just do this. And it'll hopefully, okay. Basically, uh, if, if your machine needs to be interrupted for some reason, because let's say a signal is coming from uh, the keyboard and you need to respond to it, well, you can actually jump from, you can actually have a signal from any state going into an, some other state over here to handle the interrupts, right? We'll talk about interrupts and exceptions more, but this is the program that's running. But usually when you design a system, there are external things that you need to respond to. For example, if somebody's banging on the keyboard, and if this program is running that's checking viruses in your system, you probably want your system to be responsive to your keyboard input. Right? The question is, how do you enable a processor to respond to that keyboard input? Basically, that's an, that, that needs to be an input signal coming into the state machine over here that interrupts what's going on and handles that. So we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about I.O. later, but this is to give you an idea. Why, how, do we, how do you do it? One way of doing it is whenever the interrupt signal comes, you jump to some other state. Of course, you cannot just leave the program and abandon it, right? You need to ensure that you save the state of the program somehow. So how do you save the state of the program? Remember the architectural state? Well, you basically save the architectural state, the architectural registers, and the program counter of the program so that you can come back to that point. Okay? Uh, now, the problem is if you actually jump from any state in the middle over here, your architect, uh, you, 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 you're not in a consistent architectural state at that moment, right? You modified some things uh, based on the inst instruction. So normally what happens is you take the interrupts at the beginning of execution. Before you start the instruction or after you finish the instruction, you take an interrupt and handle the interrupt and then go back to the running program. Okay? So this is a little bit more advanced. We, we're, not, we're going to cover this in a little bit more detail, but uh, your architectural state needs to be consistent when you take the interrupt. And when you come back, it's as if nothing really happened. The program continues execution. That's why we should not modify any architectural state in the middle of these states. We should really ensure that when the instruction is really done execution, you modify the architectural state. Right? If you had modified some architectural state somewhere in the middle over here, then you may be in an inconsistent state when you respond to the interrupt. Right? Okay. If that's not clear, uh, think about it a little bit, and we'll get back to it. Okay. What if an instruction generates an exception? Uh, actually, um, do you guys know about exceptions? How many of you know about exceptions? OK, good. So exception means, for example, uh, an ad, uh, 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 let's say ad is not a good example, because ad, generating exceptions with an ad is hard. Although you will see virtual memory in the future, any instruction can generate an exception. But uh, let's go back. I want to adjust the focus also. This autofocus is not working for us, I think. 
Yeah, I don't think so. So what if we do it manually? No, that's even worse. Something. We should put a service request for this. Jeremy, can you put in a request? Okay. Turn on the lights. Okay, maybe that's a smarter move. <laughs> and what is that? <laughs> I pressed the light. Okay. Oh, okay, I see. Now let's see. Is that better? It's a bit darker. I need to move what? Yes. Okay. Somehow. Okay, that's better. But still, the focus is not that great, right? Well, let me press autofocus again. All right, well, we'll, we'll have to make do with this, right? It's not terrible, right? So, okay, let me give you an example exception, right? For example, here at the decode stage, you decoded the instruction, and it's an illegal instruction. The opcode doesn't exist. And there are many cases where the opcode is not uh, defined for some reason because it's reserved for future use, for example. That's how we can extend an ISA. If somebody wants to add an instruction, you take one of these unused opcodes and you use it for the instruction. For example, in this case, if you decode, again, because of the autofocus, you cannot see, but uh, this is 1010 over here. If, you, if the opcode is 1010, that instruction is not defined. So there is no uh, finite state machine action associated with it. It's basically an illegal instruction. And normally, if a machine decodes an illegal instruction, it should really report an illegal instruction exception. You may have seen this if you try to execute uh, an illegal instruction on your laptop. So basically, this, uh, this is essentially an exceptional condition, and it should take you to a state where the exception routine is executed. And the exception routine basically does something to report to the user or report to the screen that some illegal instruction is attempted to be executed by this program. Right? So you can basically add more states over here to handle that exception. right? And you could communicate that to the user. So that's the beauty of this finite state machine. You can actually add these states, and you can add control signals associated with those states. And you can actually add data path elements, to, if needed, to execute those uh, states as you wish uh, to execute them. Does that make sense? And there could be other exceptions also. For example, here, if the, we didn't talk about protection in virtual memory, but uh, if, the, if, if here the load instruction that you're executing tries to access an address that it's not supposed to access because it belongs to some other process, well, you get an exception. In x86, it's the general protection exception, right, basically or access protection exception in many architectures. Then you can, from there, you can jump to a state that starts the routine that handles that access protection exception. Right? And again, all of those states over here are handled by the microprogram. So there's a, there, there are micro instructions associated with handling uh, that particular exception. So you could keep adding states based on the different exceptions that you need to handle. Okay. So that's, that's the power of this type of design. Let's go back. OK. So how can you implement a complex instruction using this control structure? I gave you some examples. Actually, the, the, the exception can be thought of an instruction. It's really not an instruction. It's an internal or ex exception is an internal event to the program because it's caused by the program. But interrupt is an external event uh, to the program. It's, it's caused by something else. But these are essentially complex routines that you can add uh, to the control structure, uh, to, to, the, my, uh, to the microprogram machine using the control structure. Remember the repeat MoS instruction? If you, if you don't remember, I'll jog your memory because I still have the little thing over here where I wrote the uh, pseudocode for repeat. Basically, this is an instruction uh, that, I'll just remove this. Uh, that copied uh, one array uh, to another array, byte by byte. In this case, I show you byte over here, uh, but it could be word by word also. But pictorially, what this instruction does is, uh, actually, I have a better explanation for this. <laughs> we'll keep that over here. You have your memory over here at linear array, right? 
and you have three registers, let's say ECX, x86 has eight registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, and then ED, ES, EA, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> you, can, you can imagine eight, eight of these, right? And the names are weird because it evolved that way. It used to be CX, count register, and then they extended the registers to become 32 bits. Now it became ECX. That's why you have this weird name. A was, for example, AX. It was an accumulator register, and then they extended. It became EAX, extended AX. Some history for you. <laughs> Let's call this ESI and then EDI, but these are source Source index and destination index, and they extended. It became extended source index and extended destination index. But this, uh, this, uh, is there a question? Okay. So this is the repeat move S at uh, the pseudocode level, C level, if you will. But basically, what, uh, what 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 it's supposed to do is you have an ESI pointer to the beginning of an array, and you have an EDI pointer to the beginning of a destination array. This is a source array and this, this is a destination array. What it does is basically it takes ECX number of bytes starting from ESI and copies them to the ECX number of bytes. Hopefully you have enough memory. Uh, star, uh, starting from the EDI. Basically it takes this byte over here, copies it over here. This byte over here, copies it over here. This byte over here, copies it over here. Until it copies ECX number of bytes. And as I said, as I told you earlier, this could be a million bytes, a billion bytes, as long as you can specify over here. And this could be overlapping also, as you can see over here. Right? So this is a very complex instruction, as you can see. It's not the most complex instruction, but this is one of the uh, complex instructions uh, in an ISA. So the question is, can you implement this complex instruction using this control structure? And the answer is yes, right? What do you need to do? Well, clearly, you cannot do it with this state machine because the state machine doesn't have that instruction in it. But you will need to add states to enable this instruction. Basically, there should be a repeat move s uh, opcode, for example, over here, which jumps to this repeat move s state, states, which you can add. And you can actually do interesting things like go from this state to this state until ECX becomes zero, right? When ECX becomes zero, you can go to this instruction. Something like this, right? Okay. I guess I was not really showing you what that was over here, but to repeat MOS, basically this, this, should, this could be checking whether ECX is equal to uh, greater than zero or not. And if it's greater than zero, you go this way and you keep looping. Otherwise, you go, you go to the next instruction. That's the idea. So that's the beauty of this microprogrammed machine. And each of these now consume let's say, I don't know, maybe 10 micro-instructions over here if you have 10 states, and you keep looping through that state until this condition be becomes false. So that's exactly how Intel implements x86 today. I mean, not exactly, of course, I've given you a high level, but that's, this, is, this, this instruction is micro-coded in the Intel machine, so if you do an array, a good compiler will hopefully translate that array copy, string copy, to repeat move s, and you would be running through the micro-coded engine, very similar to what we've seen. So of course you need to change the data path to enable some of those operations. You, pro you probably need to change the microsequencer to add another condition over here, right? So that you, you, you're able to do that uh, jump back, depending on what kind of micro branches you add over here. And of course uh, you need to, well you may need to add more data path elements and you need to certainly fill out the microcode and maybe add more control signals as necessary. Right? So that's the power of this microprogram machine. You could do things like this. If, they were, if this were a more advanced course, I would ask you to do this. <laughs> but I won't ask you right now. <laughs> but if you're, if you're so inclined, it's going to be extra credit. OK, so this is really an abstraction, right? We're really utilizing the power of abstraction. The concept of a control store of micro-instructions enables a hardware designer with a new abstraction. It's microprogramming. So the designer, as I told you, can translate any desired operation to a sequence of micro-instructions. All they need to do is to provide the sequence of micro-instructions needed to implement the desired operation, the ability for the control logic to correctly sequence through those micro-instructions. That's basically the changing of the micro-sequencer. And any additional data path elements and control signals needed. 
So for repeat MOS, I will assert that you will need additional data path and control signals. But there might be some cases where you don't really need uh, additional data path elements and control signals. In that case, you can basically translate the instruction into existing micro instructions. So that's kind of beautiful also. Uh, so you may actually add a new instruction to the ISA without really changing your hardware. Well, without really changing your control store at least, but by just changing this micro-sequencing uh, uh, area of your processor without changing anything else in the processor. So this actually simplifies the hardware design also. Uh, if you don't have this sort of design, you would change your pipeline, all, uh, I shouldn't say pipeline maybe, but you, should cha you would change your data path all the time. But you could now uh, get away without changing your data path. Okay, so some more microprogramming. I think I've already given you the idea. Implement RepMOS in the LC3B microarchitecture. Basically, any time you implement some new feature, you need to ask the questions. What changes do I need to make to the state machine, to the data path, to the control store, to the microsequencer? And the changes uh, could be zero, could be a lot, depending on what you want to implement. So this extra credit assignment. If someone wants to do it, please do it. I'll give you extra credit. And this is, for your information, that this, was my, my, this is the ugly uh, description from x86 uh, manual of what repeat MOS is. And this is not the full thing, by the way. And this is not the latest x86 manual, so I'm, I'm sure it changed. Basically, this is the while loop that I showed you nicely. This is the kind of ugly while loop over here. Basically, you decrement the count loop, and then... There, there are a bunch of other things in uh, x86. Uh, basically, you check whether the counter is going up or down and things like that. Uh, but also, you, uh, there's also address size. There's also data size. So as you can see over here, this is really the definition of what you need to do, associated string instruction. It depends on whether you're copying one byte, uh, two bytes, four bytes, eight bytes. And it depends on whether you're copying, uh, go going from up to down or down to up in memory. So you can go either way, right? That's the, so it, it's, even, it's an even more complicated instruction uh, than what I, I should you could You could specify with flags that uh, you're really copying, your, let's say your ESI, I'll use another pen over here. There you go. Let's say your ESI points to here and your EDI points to here. And you have a, a direction flag. It's called a direction flag in x86. One bit that specifies whether you're going up or down. If this specifies that you're going down in memory addresses, you would copy this way. <laughs> Make sense? <laughs> and the instruction needs to take care of all of that. So it's much more complicated than this little beautiful while loop over here. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay, let me ask you some questions. You could actually uh, translate this to instructions of the MIPS ISA, right? My beautiful while loop, maybe not this thing over here. How many instructions does a repeat MOS take in the MIPS ISA if, you're, if your repeat MOS is... You'll be surprised how many instructions you will uh, actually require to be able to do this. It's, in x86, it's a single instruction. And how many instructions... does it take uh, to do this? Of course, that, then you need to change the LC3B. So this is extra credit if you want to do it. If you don't, that's okay, but it's fun. So people in the world actually implement these instructions. Uh, actually, I will do one more thing before I move on to the unaligned access. Uh, I'll take this one. Nah, maybe not. This looks better. I don't know why. But basically, uh, what we're doing right now is very interesting, I think. Basically, really, we're, we're starting originally with a program, right? High-level language. And in the end, uh, we want to control the electrons, right? Actually, even higher over here, we have the problem. Okay, we've done some things over here. And here, we've decided we have some control signals that will control the electron somehow, right? The question is, what do we do to the program and the control signals in between? And there have been many, many approaches to this. And we've covered just one approach. Basically, you have 
some uh, ISA over here. This is your instruction set architecture. It's your set of instructions. And it's lower level than your high level language such that your program gets translated to this ISA, this add, multiply, load, store, some primitives. But the, as an architect, you have a choice in where to place the ISA. You could say this ISA is really, really close to the program, right? We just saw an example. This repeat move S does this. It's really close to the program, right, compared to an ad. So you're, you can place your ISA over here, have more complex instructions. Or you could place your ISA, I guess I'm running out of. Huh. He's coming handy now. There you go. <laughs> so you could place your ISA over here, right? which is really close to the control signals, maybe very primitive operations. Add is very primitive. In fact, when MIPS was designed, the philosophy was, let's be as primitive as possible, such that the hardware is simple. Going from ISA to control signals is simple, and a lot of the work is pushed on the compiler to do the translation from program to the ISA. Basically, there are many levels of translation over here, right? You basically translate, uh, I'll start with another one over here, to make this, you have this program, you have this ISA, you translate the program to the ISA, and then you need to go from ISA to the control signals. Either you go this way, or you add another thing over here called a micro ISA that's not visible to the program. That's essentially what we did with microprogramming, right? We added this micro ISA where we kind of translated the ISA into these micro ISA, the micro instructions, and then the micro ISA was essentially the control signals, uh, although it's not exactly true because you generate some control signals also on the fly. So this micro ISA, maybe I should draw this again, was really close to the control signals over here. So we translated the ISA to the micro ISA. Now we can actually do a lot more. If we add instructions to the ISA, we can do this translation over here. We have another level of optimization uh, that we can make. So you can internally change your micro ISA uh, without notifying anyone, but you can probably not change your ISA, right, because programs are already written in that ISA or translated into that ISA. Okay, let me give you some quick terminology over here. Basically, going from the program to the ISA, this is actually called if you ever see this, semantic gap. You have a gap between the semantics of the program and the semantics of the ISA. And the lower the semantic gap is, the more complex your ISA. If the semantic gap is higher, your ISA is less complex. Because semantically, it's far from your program, right? You have this program semantics, and your instructions are really far from that. It's very close to the control signals uh, over here. Okay, so uh, let me give you one more thing over here. Basically, what we did over here was translate this ISA to a micro ISA in hardware. Hard, it's, it, we'll call it hardware translation, right? We take an instruction and go through a micro sequence of uh, micro instructions. Is that the only way to do this? Just to stretch your mind a little bit. You could imagine software doing this also, right? You could imagine a layer of software that takes an ISA and basically converts things such that uh, things into a program, a, a bigger program, let's say, that implements the state machine internally, right? Those instructions will be micro instructions. Now the software needs to have the knowledge of those micro instructions somehow. Okay? And people have done both in the world. So most machines today that you buy, what they do is they take the x86 ISA. I say x86 because that's the most common ISA. They turn it into a proprietary micro ISA and do this in hardware. So every x86 instruction that gets executed in an Intel machine gets translated into this micro instructions. But you could potentially take the x86 ISA and do software translation 
into some other proprietary micro ISA, and you can actually design a processor with your micro ISA, right? If anybody heard of Transmeta, they tried to do this in the late 1990s. Who has heard of Transmeta, by the way? Cool, wow. You guys are either old like me or you read a lot. <laughs> yeah, so this was uh, a company that basically took the x86 ISA and translated it with what they called the code morphing software. So they had a much cooler name than software translation layer. <laughs> they morphed the code into their proprietary uh, ISA, which was very, very different from this. It was a VLIW ISA, which we will hopefully talk about, very long instruction word ISA, where you could actually pack many instructions together such that you can execute them in parallel. Of course, they didn't survive very well, but that's okay. That's a separate story. <laughs> but you could do this at different layers, and uh, there are always trade-offs associated with it, basically. Software translation is, of course, you need to minimize the overheads of that. This is also called uh, dynamic binary translation, if you will. You basically translate a binary from one language or ISA to another language or ISA, because ISA is essentially a language bet uh, between the hardware and the software. Uh, and there's some overhead of this. But there's also overhead in hardware. Whenever you add hardware, we added overhead over here. You need to add the microsequencer. And if you have lots of instructions, that overhead increases. In fact, uh, one of the big overheads uh, that we have in a processor like this is the decoding overhead, which essentially goes to, goes to this translation. OK. We could, go, we could, we could go, go even more deeper over here, but that's probably good enough for now. Good, you guys can read at least some things. It's not that badly autofocused. OK, any questions? Cool. OK, there's an aside over here. Uh, and you, if, if, you're, if you're doing your readings, you will already have figured out. Uh, the, the state machine over here talks about alignment, memory alignment, not the state machine. Uh, the, data path over here. So you could actually have unaligned accesses in uh, LC3B. Basically, you can have a byte load or byte store instruction. These move data that are not aligned at the word address boundary. Basically, you can have memory that's word addressed. OK, I'll use another one over here. Boy, Now I wish that we had a very fast way of switching between these things. OK, um, where did I put this? Yeah, here it is. Basically, remember in the logic over here, and I would encourage you to do the reading uh, that you have, there is a data size component. This data size can be a byte or a word. Word is basically two bytes in LC3B, and a byte is one byte, clearly. Uh, when you read from memory, you really read a word. So if you think of memory, and a lot of memory is organized this way. We'll talk about it uh, in more detail. Uh, it's a byte addressable memory. You can address every byte. But this memory is organized as a uh, sequence of words, meaning basically in each memory location, you have two, or, uh, two bytes, byte 0, byte 1. Byte 2, byte 3, byte 4, byte 6, byte 5, dot, 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 basically. So whenever you access memory location 0 or word address 0, you really get two bytes, 0 and 1. Now, if you're loading a word that starts from 0, this is fine, basically. You've loaded these two words, and you can put it in the register. But if you want to load a byte, uh, if, if, you're, if your instruction says, let's say, load... Uh, the byte at address 1, you really, you're getting the word. You really want to pick the right one and supply it to the register. Does that make sense? That's, that's called an unaligned, uh, well, uh, that's called an unaligned access because this byte is not aligned at the word boundary, right? It's really aligned at the byte boundary, but it's not starting from 0. 
right? Uh, the, these are aligned. These these bytes are aligned at the word boundary because they're, they're the beginning of the word. Zero, two, four, six, eight, dot, dot, dot. But this byte comes from the top part of the word, if you will. So you really need to take this and put it in the right location in the register. And that's exactly what this alignment logic over here does. Make sense? You'll need to read it. I'm not going to cover this in more detail. We'll talk about it when we come to memory. Uh, but let me tell you how more complicated it could get. This is really a granularity problem. Basically, the granularity of the access of access to the memory is really a word granularity here, right? You're accessing a word over here. And whenever you're accessing only a part of it or something that spans multiple words, boundaries of that granularity, that's called an unaligned access. That's the definition of unaligned access. You're not aligned to the granularity at which you're accessing uh, memory. So you will need to add logic to handle that unaligned access. Let me give you another example. Let's say this is 10, 11, 12, 13. These are the bytes. These are the byte addresses. Let's assume that we supported an instruction that says load word starting from address 11. This means that you need to get two bytes starting from address 11, 11 and 12, bytes 11 and 12. Now, LC3B, if you read the documentation, it doesn't support this one. It supports load bytes and aligned, uh, aligned, aligned load words. It doesn't support unaligned word loads or word stores. But this is another unaligned case, basically. Here, you're, you're supplying address 11 to memory and demanding two bytes out of it. If your memory, with one access, you can get only a word, too bad. You cannot complete this instruction with one access to memory, right? Because the first access, let's say your address is 11, first access will get you the byte at 11, but you also need the byte at 12. So you need to do another access to get the byte at 12 and then merge them and place it into a register. Does that make sense? So this unaligned access now has complicated our life a little bit because the granularity of the memory does, just doesn't match uh, what we're really trying to load. Basically, the granularity of the memory doesn't match the alignment of what we're trying to load. So, and this is a real problem. Uh, this happens at different levels of the memory hierarchy also. For example, you can get unaligned cache accesses. A cache in an x 6 machine, we will talk about caches, but it's 64 bytes. A cache block is 64 bytes. Now, let's assume that you're trying to access a word that spans two cache blocks. Uh, the beginning of your word, the two bytes, in x86, a word is four bytes. The two bytes are over here, and the next two bytes happen to be over here. Well, tough luck. You need to do two cache accesses. And if both of them are not in the cache, you need to do two memory accesses to, uh, to, to serve this unaligned uh, word access across two, uh, two cache blocks. So who does this? Whose responsibility is this? Again, computer architecture is the art of trade-offs, right? You could say, programmer, deal with it. As a hardware designer, I don't want to do it. And people have made that choice. MIPS is one example. MIPS doesn't allow unaligned accesses unless you really specify them. In fact, the original MIPS actually didn't have anything to do with unaligned access. I believe they've added it recently. The philosophy in MIPS, again, hardware is simple. Software deals with it. That's one choice. That simplifies the hardware, but makes programmers' life harder. Now the programmer needs to think about the alignment. If, if they want to get good performance, they need to think about the alignment of memory, right? In fact, uh, they need to really align things so that the program would work uh, if the unaligned access are not supported uh, in, the, in the memory side. Or you could say, okay, it's the job of the hardware designer to do this. Now you're making life easier for the programmer. The programmer doesn't need to deal with this unaligned access. Right? Now the job of the hardware is harder because the hardware needs to add some finite state machine control logic 
to ensure that you handle this unaligned access, right? You do two accesses to memory when needed. And that takes extra time. But programmer's life is easier. So it's always a trade-off between the programmer and the micro architect. I'll, 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 I'll put a parentheses over here because it's also the architect, right? You can make programmer's life really hard by making architect's life really easy, or you can make programmer's life really easy by making architect's life really hard. So what trade-off do you make? <laughs> I'll give you one example. Multi-core processor is a very beautiful example of this, I think. Uh, so a lot of programmers write single-threaded code, right? It's very hard for people to go from single-threaded code and parallelize it to many threads, at least for most programmers. You can say, I'm going to take the single-thread code, I'm going to break my back to execute it extremely fast. That's a very fast single, uh, very fast single core processor. Programmers life easy because they do business as usual. They execute the single thread code. Architects life is extremely hard because now they need to design this processor that gets all of the performance and they need to keep improving the performance. Now architects life became so hard at some point that they basically punted. They said, okay, we cannot design the single core processor that keeps improving the performance anymore. So we're going to design multi-core processors. Now multi-core processor, you punted the problem to the programmer a little bit, right? They need to somehow parallelize their code. Now programmer's life is hard, architect's life is easy. So there are many, many examples of this. And in this course, you should probably take uh, those examples and think about them because people have made many choices. Okay. Let me get back to access. So you know what they are and you know what they mean. Okay, we talked about this. How does the hardware ensure this works correctly? Well, additional hardware cost. And you can see that uh, in the appendix C.5. It's beautifully done for load byte and store byte instructions, but this is also simple. And you need to have additional logic to handle unaligned accesses. So there's another site, memorymapped.io. I'll, I'll introduce that also. We'll, we'll cover this a little bit more when we talk about I.O. systems. Uh, ugly block over here, or block that kind of looks ugly, uh, that basically checks whether the addresses that you're accessing during loads or stores to are mapped to I.O. devices. So there, there's a way of doing input-output. How do you, for example, communicate from a program to an I.O. device? Right? How do you write to the monitor, let's say? You do a store to a particular register, let's say the monitor data register, or mo you do a store to uh, the monitor address register and write the data to the monitor data register. Now, these are actually mapped to memory. You, uh, instead of having all of your memory as part of your memory, you say, oh, these address ranges, my terrible writing. That's the downside of typing on phone now. This address range is dedicated to memory, uh, dedicated to a uh, monitor. This address range is dedicated to keyboard. So whenever I write to this address range, I'm really writing to the monitor's data register, and there's some hardware in the monitor that takes that data and outputs it. We're not going to talk about that part. But this concept is called memory mapped input and output. We're really memory mapping the input and output such that we can do loads and stores to those input and output devices, just like we're doing loads and stores to memory. Now, how does the load and store gets communicated to the I.O. device? Well, that's the part of, that's what this hardware over here does. It basically checks the memory address, this address control logic actually. It checks the memory address and sees if it's really in a region that's targeting an I.O. device. If it is, then it really doesn't do anything in the memory path, but it sends the requests to the I.O. devices over here. And you can see that there's a keyboard data register, keyboard status register, and there's other things more over here. This is the output device over here. There's a status register and a data register. So we basically are really writing to the output device or reading from the input device instead of 
going through this memory over here. And this is a very common way of handling uh, uh, handling. So let me uh, finish this one and we'll take a break. Basically, this address control logic over there determines whether the specified address of load and store are to the memory or I.O. devices and correspondingly enable memory or I.O. devices and sets up MUXs. And you can see the control signals associated with it. And the signals are dependent on the memory address. So these are actually signals, these are actually control signals that you cannot store in the control store. Well, I'll finish with this. Because they're really dependent on the address you generate it in the data path, right? So there are some control signals that you can really not store in your control store. Because if, actually, if you think about it, you can store anything in your control store, but the cost will be very high, right? You can have the memory address as an input to your control store, and you can make your control store control signals, uh, decide your control signals based on that, but that may not be a good idea because that increases the size of your control store quite quickly. Okay, let's take a break and we'll finish microprogram control and start pipelining. Yes. Um, I have a question. I'd like to do this project with a friend. Um, he's a machine. Okay. With a friend. Okay. Let's continue. So we've actually covered a lot of concepts, even though we talked about microprogramming. Hopefully you have a good idea of memory mapped I.O. at a conceptual level and unaligned accesses and some problems associated with it as well. So we're, gonna, we're finishing up microprogram control. Let's finish up with advantages. Uh, so like everything else, it has advantages and disadvantages. I think in this case, advantages over, uh, outweigh the disadvantages quite a bit. Uh, but basically, there are three key advantages. One is, we've, we've just seen that you can allow a simple design to do very powerful computation by controlling the data path using a sequencer. Right? As I showed you, a high-level ISA is translated into microcode or sequence of microinstructions. And microcode enables a minimal data path to emulate an ISA, an executing an ISA. And as, as we discussed, micro-instructions can be thought of as a user-invisible ISA, as, if, as you remember from this translation layers, which is kind of messed up right now. But you basically have a micro-ISA level that's not visible to the user. And because of this, it also enables easy extensibility of the ISA. You can support new instruction by changing the microcode, and you can support complex instructions as a sequence of simple micro-instructions, like repeat move S, or even simpler instructions like increment a memory location. This, this instruction exists, for example, in x86. If you want to increment a memory location, it could be composed of two instructions, load and increment, right? And of course, you need to ensure that it works correctly. And it also enables powerful things like update of machine behavior. Now, what do I mean by that? If you have a buggy implementation of an instruction, hopefully this enables you the flexibility to fix that implementation by changing the microcode in the field, right? Or even earlier, right? Usually when you design a processor, after the processor comes back, the first thing you do is debug it. This is called post-silicon debug, right? Hopefully you didn't have enough bugs, but there Invariably, there are bugs. And during this post-silicon debug stage, there are a lot of microcode updates that processor designers apply to fix buggy implementations. Now, if you didn't have a microcode design, it's a little bit harder to fix the design. You need to ensure things are fixable. Whereas this microcode enables you to uh, do better, uh, better bug fixing, if you will. In fact, you could add fields to the microcode to enable, to, to enable better bug fixing during this post-silicon debug stage. And if the bug somehow escapes to the field, you couldn't cache it during post-silicon debug, but later you caught it after it's sold to the customers. If you can fix the bug with a microcode patch, then you can release a microcode patch and you can apply that microcode patch with some other patches together perhaps, right? And this happens in the field today also, if it's doable. That's, of course, harder. If the bug propagates more, then it becomes a lot harder, right? We talk about the row hammer failure problem, right? That's very hard to fix, for example, with this sort of mechanism. But there are, there are cases where you can fix things. 
Okay, and this is, of course, easier to do if the data path provides the ability to do the same thing in different ways. If you can go through this adder to do the add versus this adder to do the add, and you pick this other adder and somehow it, became, it caused a bug, well, you pick the other adder to fix the bug, right? So if your data path is, uh, in the, this is where a minimal data path is not good. If you want dependability or bug tolerance, in general, minimalism doesn't help you as much. You really want redundancy in that case. And that's a very fundamental principle also because redundancy enables you to do that, use that other redundant data path that doesn't have a bug, for example. Right. Okay, so this is very powerful as you can see. The downside, of course, a little bit more complexity. Uh, so let me talk about this last one, uh, update of machine behavior a little bit because this is really fun. Uh, basically, the ability to update or patch microcode in the field uh, enables ability to add new instructions without changing the processor also, right? Now you can actually extend your ISA while the processor is already released into the system. Assuming, again, your data path elements uh, are able to do that. And ability to fix buggy hardware implementations. Uh, so there are several examples of this. Some of them are old, some of them are new. Uh, one of them, uh, this is a very early machine in the 1960s. IBM designed this uh, 370. This is actually the start of the virtual machine uh, era. IBM 370 actually was a virtual machine. Uh, basically, it had microcode stored in main memory, and you could update it after a reboot. Of course, you need to be privileged, but uh, you could actually do that. So every, after every reboot, you could change the machine behavior. Right? That sounds like fun, right? Uh, IBM System Z, which is much more modern uh, right now, which is actually one of the uh, very powerful processors used in banking, for example, transaction processing, uh, they actually d do something similar. You could uh, update the microcode after a reboot. And this, if you're so inclined, you can read a, read a report that's written by IBM in 2004. They called it millicode. Different people call it different things. But, uh, yeah. And there, there are even funkier things. Burrow 1700. You could actually update the microcode while the processor is running. So you could actually change the microcode. This is another very virtual machine. There, there, th this was a really funky machine because you could actually really... Uh, it was a bit addressable machine. Every bit could be changed. Uh, you could address every bit in the system. And you can read why they did it. Basically, this was a user microprogrammable machine. Now the question is... Oh, that, that, this is now becoming an ISA almost, right? The user can modify. So you expose a microcode to the user, now it's an ISA. And if you're, if you're really, really so inclined, you could read this microprogramming environment paper from 1972, but uh, probably you won't understand a whole lot because the terminology those days was a little bit different uh, from terminology today. Okay. So we're finishing up multi-cycle versus single cycle. I'm not going to go through this, but you, for, this is for you to fill in. So you, you should really know the advances and disadvantages of multi-cycle, single cycle, microprogrammed multi-cycle versus hardwired uh, multi-cycle uh, multi as well. So the question to always ask is, can we do better? Never be satisfied is good uh, if you want to get to the, uh, if you want to advance the state of the art, right? And people clearly ask that after microprogram machines. I'll ask you, can we do better than this? I guess people say yes. <laughs> so one limitation that I see over here is limited concurrency, right? We designed this machine, but we're really spending so many cycles to execute an instruction. Six cycles to do uh, a load, for example, in uh, LC3B. And what is worse is, while you're doing a load, while, uh, while you're in part of the uh, finite state machine over here, oh, let's see. So, for example, if you're in this state over here, when you're fetching an instruction, everything else is idle, right? So when you're accessing memory over here, the rest of the data path is basically twiddling its thumbs, waiting, doing nothing, right? That sounds like a waste, especially if you want to improve performance. Basically, that's, the, that's what limited concurrency means. Idle when you're doing some operations. Okay, basically, some hardware resource idle during different phases of instruction processing cycle. For example, fetch logic is idle when instruction is being decoded or executed. Most of the data path is idle when a memory access is happening. So can we actually do multiple things at the same time in the data path to improve this concurrency 
and hopefully improve performance. Right? And the, the, of course, it's yes. Basically, why would we like more concurrency? Because we can get higher instruction throughput. Instead of executing six cycles per instruction or finishing one instruction every six cycles, maybe we could finish one instruction every cycle if we pipeline things such that while we're doing some work for this instruction, we're doing some other work for this instruction, and some other work for this instruction, and some other work for this instruction. Right? That's the idea, basically. When an instruction is using some resources, process other instructions on idle resources that are not needed by that instruction. For example, when an instruction is being decoded, fetch the next instruction. When an instruction is being executed, decode another instruction, decode the next instruction. When an instruction is accessing data memory, execute the next instruction. And when an instruction is writing, resu writing its result into the register file, access data memory for the next instruction. So that's the idea of pipelining, basically. And I've already given you the idea. <laughs> but let me repeat it. More systematically, pipeline the execution of multiple instructions. Don't wait until the previous instruction finished. And the analogy is assembly line processing of instructions, right? Everybody goes through the assembly line, and while one instruction is later in the assembly line, another instruction is entering the assembly line. Uh, we divide the instruction processing cycle into distinct stages of processing, and ensure that there are enough hardware resources to process an instruction in each stage. That's important. So we will increase the hardware resources for this. And we process a different instruction in each stage. And instructions in consecutive and program order are processed in consecutive stages. And the benefit is this increases instruction processing throughput. Basically, again, I'll repeat it. Instead of taking six instructions, uh, six cycles per an instruction, or finishing one instruction every six cycles, so if you look at this state machine over here, uh, yeah, this one, we're finishing one instruction. Let's, uh, if it's an add instruction, we're finishing one instruction. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Should be, this should remember the last state it's in. That's prediction, right? We will talk about that. But basically, still doesn't work? Why is that? How about this? Now I can see it works. <laughs> so one, two, three, four, five. Basically five cycles. Actually, if memory takes longer, maybe 10 cycles, right? Depending on how long the memory takes. So instead of finishing one instruction every 10 cycles, hopefully we'll finish one instruction every cycle because we'll be putting one instruction into the pipeline every cycle. So that's the idea over here. And if you have multiple pipelines that are operating in parallel, maybe you can fit more than one instruction per cycle, right? If you have five parallel pipelines or four parallel pipelines, you finish four instructions per cycle. That's how you can improve performance significantly. Okay, let's go back. So that's the benefit, hopefully. But we'll see a lot of gotchas in this. The downside, start thinking about this. There's always a downside. So we're going to add more hardware cost. We're going to add more overhead. And we're going to take each instruction take longer to be able to do this. So let's, do, let's look at the beautiful case first. Multi-cycle looks like this. Let's assume that you, have, you take always four cycles per instruction. Let's assume that these are independent add instructions. It looks like this, basically. First instruction finishes in four cycles, next instruction four cycles. So you take about 12 cycles to finish four instructions. You'll see how stupid this is when I give you the next analogy. Uh, but if you pipeline it, this is what you get, basically. When you're decoding the first instruction, you fetch the next one. When you're executing uh, the first instruction, you're decoding the next one, and you're fetching the next one. And this is where the pipeline is full. If you'll, it's called a full pipeline. All of the stages in the processing are occupied by uh, instructions that are hopefully useful. Right. Now, at the steady state, you're finishing four instructions per cycle. Uh, uh, four basically, you're processing four instructions in one cycle, but in the steady state over here, you're really finishing one instruction per cycle, or four instructions in four cycles. Make sense? But of course, life is not always this beautiful. But this is the beautiful case. Ideally, with an ideal pipeline, this is what you would get in terms of throughput. But there are a lot of non-idealities in other things also. And we'll talk about those non-idealities and how to handle them. Okay, let me give you the analogy to show you how multi-cycle is so stupid, right? I just convinced you that a multi-cycle is good. But now let's see why it's so stupid. So assume that you have a bunch of 
clothes, dirty clothes, to finish, and uh, you want to do them separately, do you do them this way? First of all, you first uh, put stuff into the washer, and then when the washer is finished, put it into the dryer, and then fold them, and then put the clothes away, or ask your roommate to do the stuff. Whatever, basically four different steps, each taking 30 minutes. You do them, and then only after that, you start the next load. That sounds stupid, right? You wouldn't do that as a human being. Why are we putting machines doing independent loads, independent instructions this way? It's essentially a multi-cycle machine. So you spent your beautiful evening doing four loads of laundry. That sounds terrible. Now, if you can offload it to your roommate, your poor roommate has spent some of his or her evening to do this. So here, it looks like an instruction, actually. The steps to do a load are sequentially dependent. You're not going to put uh, things into the dryer before you wash them. You could, but that defeats the purpose, probably, of doing laundry. And you're not going to fold them before you dry them. And you're not going to put them into, the, uh, um, into your closet before you fold them. I guess you could skip, skip the steps. Not all instructions have the same steps. Not all programs have the same requirements, right? But there's, there's clearly a sequential dependence within an instruction. And across different loads, across different instructions, there is no dependence, right? You could start this load right after you move it to the dryer. There's no dependence between these two, between these four, actually. I guess I cannot imagine. Different steps do not share resources, right? There is no resource sharing. The washer and dryer are completely separate. So as a result, you can perfectly pipeline this. Basically, this is what a pipelined processing of laundry looks like. Right? Once the first load finishes in the washer, you put it into the dryer, but you also start the second load in the washer. And dot, dot, dot. You can see the idea. So you do four loads of laundry in parallel in the steady state. So if you look at the steady state, this is what's happening. No additional resources are needed over here. Uh, throughput is increased by four, as you can see, and you have the rest of your evening to enjoy. To study computer architecture. That's what enjoy means, right? At least for me. I guess that's not that funny for, for all of you sorry, who, who are waiting for the Easter break. And latency per load is the same. As you can see, we didn't increase the latency. Of course, it's a perfect case. We will see that we will increase the latency uh, in instruction processing. Um, but let's see one example over here. Who has experience in doing laundry here? Who has done their own laundry? Okay, good. <laughs> and which, which stage actually takes the longest? Anybody? The washer, the dryer, the folding? Dryer, yeah? That damn dryer. That always takes the longest. And I agree with you. <laughs> It always takes the longest, and as a result, it causes an imperfect pipeline over here. Now, you can, we could go into the mechanics of the dryer and why it takes longer and dot, 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 but we're not going to do that over here. One way is to fix the dryer, such that it doesn't take long. But if it takes long, now you have this problem, right? The slowest stage decides your throughput because you cannot put stuff into the dryer before the dryer finishes the first load, right? As a result, your throughput reduces. Instead of finishing your laundry at 9.30 over here, you finish it at 11.30 over here. Now, how do you fix this problem? The same, the same thing happens with instructions as well, right? If your register file access takes two cycles, you have the same problem, right? How do you fix this problem? Have a faster dryer. That's one solution. You, say it again. Excellent. Buy another dryer. Right? Using two dryers, now you restore the throughput, right? Dryer A, dryer B. Now, if you want to have a high throughput pipeline, you add hardware, basically. That's the takeaway. Okay, so an ideal pipeline would increase throughput with little increase in cost. Unfortunately, that's not always possible, so we're going to add hardware cost. But let's look at an ideal pipeline. What do you need? Basically, we, if, for the pipeline to be ideal, we want to repeat the identical operations, meaning the same operations repeated on a large number of different inputs. For example, laundry loads always go through the same steps. Washing is repeated on many, many loads. Drying is repeated on many, many loads. Instructions, fetch is repeated on many, many instructions. 
Decode is repeated on many, many instructions. So the more steps you have that are identical across instructions, the better you are. Because you're u- utilizing the same hardware to, do, to process many different instructions. Independence is very important. You should not have dependencies between repeated operations. Basically, the loads, you can, par- you can pipeline them very well because they're independent of each other. If the instructions are independent, that's good. But if they're dependent on each other, if, a, if you need to do a multiply that's dependent on an add, now you have added a dependency, and you may not be able to really start the multiply. If you have a multiply that needs the result of a load, well, you may not be able to start the multiply right before the load result is available. So now they're not perfectly independent of each other. If the load takes 500 cycles especially, right, now you have a problem. So this is clearly very important. Well, there's another problem with instruction processing. How do you know which instruction to fetch next? Right? If you're going sequentially, that's good. But what if you have a branch instruction that's dependent on a data, branch equal, for example, and MIPS, and you need to resolve that branch? You cannot even figure out what to put into the pipeline at that point, right? So you can guess. You can say, oh, I'm not going to take this branch, so I'm going to keep sequ- going sequentially. But that's a guess. You need to verify that guess. And if you're wrong, you need to flush the pipeline. So now you're seeing the issue of dependence, right? This is control dependence, which is different from data dependence. It's really a special case of data dependence, really. So independent operations is critical, but we're not going to get that. That's why life is not as good. Uh, and the third requirement for an ideal pipeline is uni- uniformly partitionable sub-operations. Basically, processing can be evenly divided into uniform latency sub-operations. And this is basically a balanced pipeline. Fetch takes the same amount of time as decode, the same amount of time as the next stage, the same amount of time as the next stage, the same amount of time as the next stage. And because it's happening in a single clock cycle. Now, for some reason, decode is much faster. It doesn't need the entire clock cycle. You're really wasting that clock cycle. right? You didn't uniformly partition your sub-operations. As a result, you really pipeline things, but you really don't need that much time to finish that sub-operation, to finish the decode, so you wasted your clock cycle, which means that your pipeline is not balanced in this case. We, now, we saw this problem in multi-cycle architecture also. This is essentially a problem of balancing the critical paths. It's not only the critical paths, because critical path may be the worst case, but it's really the operation that you're doing. So you could be increasing the processing latency of an instruction because of this. And we will see that. So it's not clear if these are ideal pipelines, but the example that I gave you in doing laundry is an ideal pipeline. Uh, automobile assembly, I'm not sure. But clearly, instruction processing cycle is not an ideal pipeline. So let's look at the lower level view of this. Basically, we have this, this is a single cycle machine, if you look at this. And we're, we're, we basically execute uh, different portions of the instruction processing within a cycle. Let's, let's call it T picoseconds, right? Your bandwidth or throughput is 1 over t in this case. Now, if we have two pipeline stages and somehow partition them, ideally, we would like our bandwidth to be 2 over t. And if we partition them into 3, ideally, we would like that to be 3 over t, right? That sounds beautiful. Now, the problem is there are a lot of overheads over here. At the hardware level, you basically uh, have a latch delay. It's not just the T, this combination logic delay, but there's also the latch delay. So your throughput is really 1 o- divided by T plus S, where S is the latch delay. Now, if you, if you uh, do uh, a pipelined uh, version over here, each, stage, each stage's throughput is 1 divided by uh, the T divided by T, K picoseconds plus the delay over here. So if you think about it, the maximum bandwidth that you can get is the minimum logic over here, minimum combination logic, is one gate delay, plus you still pay the latching overhead. So if you think about it from a throughput perspective, your throughput is really limited by the latching delay, latching overheads, plus the minimum combination logic delay. So how minimum can you make this combination logic determines the uh, extent of your pipelining, but usually your performance degrades much earlier than this one gate. So people have argued, for example, you should really have about eight gates or so to have an ideal pipeline. But anyway, you don't need to know about that. Now, another thing to note over here, as you add stages over here, you're really adding, accumulating 
uh, this latch delay. So if you add uh, latch delay, basically reduces throughput because it has switching overhead between stages, but it also increases your latency. Right? For example, let's say you have 20 different pipeline stages over here. Your, your latency is not just t picoseconds plus s, it's really t picoseconds plus 20s. Right? That's how long it takes to execute an instruction. Now you increase your latency. And what is worse is, it's not just, because you cannot uniformly divide. This is the uniformly sub, uh, partitionable sub-operations. Let's say k is 20, 20 stages. It's not that this will take t over 20 picoseconds. You'd be very happy if it does. It'll, it usually takes longer than that, actually. So let's say this takes t over 15 picoseconds. Now, instead, uh, you, you multiply that by t uh, tw 20. So you have 20t divided by 15. So you increase the processing time in the combinational logic, plus you've added latch delay for 20 of those stages. So you really increased your latency of processing. The argument is, if you can keep the pipeline full, your throughput remains the same, but your latency increases for each instruction. So if your throughput remains the same, that's good, right? So overall program execution time will hopefully reduce but individual instruction latency increases. And again, this is a very fundamental trade-off between throughput and latency in pipelines. Okay, so there's also a cost aspect of this. If you look at this non-pipeline version, the cost is number of gates that you have, let's say, and the latch cost. But if you have a k-stage perfectly pipeline version, hopefully you'll divide the g gates uh, for each stage to g divided by k. Again, that's, not, that's perfect. That's very hard to achieve. But your latch overhead jumps up the roof again, right? If you have L, stage, uh, L stages over here, you pay the latch overhead for every stage. And if you have big latches, we will see why it will become big soon, because we will need to propagate the control signals in a pipeline. This will become relatively high. So we're going to add hardware cost. If not for the combination logic, which we will also add, uh, definitely for the latching overhead. So latches increase hardware cost. So nothing comes at a cost, basically. So let's look at the pipe, uh, pipelining instruction processing a little bit. You've seen this before. This is the instruction processing cycle. And we're going to divide it into five stages, again, arbitrary. Uh, people spend a lot of time balancing the pipeline stages in real life. We're not going to do that. So this is one of the single cycle react architectures that we've seen. You don't need to exactly bother about exactly how it looks, but they look all similar, as I've shown you in the single cycle uh, recap. We divided this into stages, basically. This is what it looks like. And we decided our clock cycle time is about 200 picoseconds. Now, immediately, there is a stage that really doesn't need 200 picoseconds. It turns out it needs only 100 picoseconds. Well, we've basically given up the remaining 100 picoseconds over there. We've wasted 100 picoseconds per instruction. Too bad. That's what happens if you don't balance your pipeline stages. And again, there's another one over here. Right. And you need to be very careful about these loops that go through boundaries, right? Here in the single cycle, you basically update the program counter. Now you're fetching something. How do you update the program counter at the same time? You need to be very careful about those uh, uh, things. So for example, here, you, we're going to write back uh, to the register file. We need to use the right register uh, ID, cor you mean correct register ID as the destination register. It cannot come from this stage. It has to come from this stage, right? Because the pipe, the instruction has moved to the stage, which means that you need to carry with the instruction every single thing that you will need in the future. The register ID that you're going to uh, store something into, you'd better carry it to the right back stage, such that you write it right back to the right register. That now increases the amount of logic that you need to add, both in terms of buses, as well as registers. OK, let's assume we divide into stages this way, fetch, decode, register, file read, execute, address calculation, memory access, and write back. And this is the register file write that's kind of emulated over here. But we'll, we'll talk about that. And ignore that for now. We'll go, go about that. There are many questions. Is this the correct partitioning? Maybe not. Uh, why not four or six stages? Why not different boundaries? And that's where some of the art comes in. Uh, maybe sometimes by increasing the number of stages, you can actually get better performance. Right? Because you divide things better. If you have two-stage pipeline, dividing things better might be difficult. But increasing the number of stages, you clearly add more overhead also. 
but you could eventually end up with a better performance. So let's look at the throughput of this pipeline. We uh, remember, we divide it into one, two, three, four, five stages. So ideally, we, wa we want to, we expect 5x throughput, right? I'm going to give you some three, three instructions that are independent of each other, three loads. This is the single cycle, and this is the performance improvement uh, you get with a pipeline. This is how long it takes. Sing uh, single cycle machine takes about 2,400 picoseconds. But the good thing is the single cycle machine spends only as much time as the sub-operation needs. So the register file access needs 100 picoseconds. You spend only 100 picoseconds. In the pipeline machine, you spend 200 picoseconds because that's the stage dedicated to register file access. Right? So if you look at this, pipeline looks good. It's faster, but it's not five times faster. It's really four times faster in this case in the steady state, if you do the steady state calculation over here. Why? Well, they, because of this, basically. We're really wasting this, uh, this part of this cycle and this part of this write-back cycle. We didn't partition things well. And this is a really, really ideal example. As you can see, it doesn't even include the latch overheads, right? Here, I, didn't, um, I, I said that uh, we didn't add a latch overhead over here. Okay. So we need to add pipeline registers. So, uh, so to take the single cycle architecture and pipeline it like this, we need to add pipeline registers at the end of each stage. And we did this for the multi-cycle architecture, so it's going to be very similar. Uh, but we're going to look at pipeline control. So uh, examples, basically, you need to uh, put the instruction register over here, instruction, and PC plus four over here, and all of the other things that you read, read the th stuff that you read from the register file, the immediate and other things over here. Uh, the data that you read from memory and the ALU's output over here, so that you can write it back. But you need, uh, and clearly no resources used by more than one stage, but there will be loops that you need to handle carefully. Uh, and all instruction classes must follow the same path and the timing through the pipeline stages. So let's take an example. This is a load word. You fetch it, you decode it, you address generate over here, and then you access memory, and then you write it back. So load word is good because it uses all of the stages, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, load word, exactly. So this is what I mentioned earlier. Basically, when you write back, you need to use the correct register number, which really needs to come from here. The destination register, you should have, when you decode it, uh, load word, you should have kept the destination register number, propagated it, and when the load word comes here, you should use that destination register number and the associated control signal to write into that destination register to place the data that you loaded into the destination register. Make sense? So you need to use the right data and right control at the right stage. Okay, hopefully this is clear. Well, we've just talked about uh, any performance impact, so this is referring to uh, this part. Some, some instructions don't need all the stages, right? For example, uh, an ALU operation doesn't really need to access memory, yet it's still going through that memory access stage. Well, too bad, right, again. That's the cost of pipelining. It needs to go through this memory access stage, waste 200 picoseconds, because the alternative is bad. The alternative is you need to remove it somehow from the pipeline and handle it, but we're going to talk about something like that later on. Uh, basically, uh, there is a performance impact because uh, that instruction could have potentially finished earlier, but then it would break the pipeline, right? If you actually finish it earlier and do something else, basically write its result back over here, now you have another issue. If there is another instruction over here, the lo a, load, a, a, a load instruction that's writing to this register, and there is another uh, add instruction that's trying to write to that register from this stage, which one takes precedence, which one writes. Okay, think about this. This is actually a dependency that you need to resolve in a pipeline. Okay, this is another example. Uh, again, two independent instructions, load and sub, go through the pipeline nicely, but this sub basically does nothing during this memory stage, right? Life is not always this beautiful, unfortunately. Let me give you some beautiful pictures. This is basically what, uh, to define some terms. This is steady state, as I've shown you. Full pipeline, you have instructions over here, and you have time over here, and over time, instructions flow through different stages, and once you fill the pipeline, it looks beautiful like this. Right. 
This is another view. This is the resource view of it. Basically, these are different stages, and these are different time steps, and this is what it's processing at that time, right? Different instructions. This is very simple. Just to, And a full pipeline looks beautiful, but the problem is we're not going to have a full pipeline most of the time. That sounds sad, right? You design this pipeline, <laughs> and we're going to try to make it full later on. So, uh, okay. Basically, the control points that we have are identical as a single cycle data path. There's nothing really that different because we're controlling the same data path, except we've added some things uh, to the, uh, like the registers. So uh, what kind of control signals do we want? For a given instruction, we have the same control signals, but control signals are required at different cycles, right? uh, depending on the stage. For example, when you're writing to the register, that control signal is required at that time. It's not required earlier, but you need to carry it with you. So there are two options here. One is decoding once using the same logic as a single cycle control logic and buffer the signals until we're, we have consumed them. It looks like this, basically. We have a huge decoder over here based on the instruction that generates the control signals as much as possible. And these control signals are generated for this execute stage, this memory stage, and this write-back stage. And initially, you store them all at this pipeline register, so it looks huge. And then... This, the control signals that are consumed by that stage don't get propagated, but new control signals may potentially be generated. So you can see that uh, the control signals that are needed for write-back are propagated to this stage, and then they're propagated to the write-back stage, and then they're used over here. Right. Make sense? So now we're adding more to the registers, pipeline registers. They're becoming bigger. And if you have a huge instruction set, this may be a huge pipeline register over here. Or... Another option is to do local decoding. So this is uh, decoding globally, if you will, once. Or you can carry relevant instruction words and fields down the pipeline and decode locally within each or in a previous stage. Now, if you remember my, uh, what is that, my principle, yeah, basic principle, you would rather decode in a previous stage, right? You basically carry some of the instruction and you do some local decoding over here to generate the control signals that are needed for this stage. That way you can get rid of the overhead of some of these registers a little bit. But now you add more combinational logic. Basically, you distribute your control logic or decoding across the stages, which may not be a bad option, actually, as long as you can do that. So which one's better? The answer is it depends. <laughs> Basically, it depends on the design and what you're, uh, what you're constrained with. Right? Sometimes it may be better to generate the control signals than just propagate them. That sounds simple, right? OK. So this are, these are the pipeline control signals. Again, this basically shows that you have a control logic that generates different control signals for the different stages, and you propagate them. You can see that the ALU op control signal is used from this X part, execute part, and this, some of the memory control signals are used over here, memory write control signal, for example. Uh, OK. So there, there, there are interesting things like this. For example, this is the register write signal that we, that we were talking about. You basically propagate the register write signal and also the write register uh, ID over here and use them at the write back stage. So this is another example. We remember, we discussed two single cycle pipelines. Everything is very similar. It doesn't matter. This is a single cycle pipeline over here. And we have the, a similar uh, selection of boundaries uh, to divide into a pipeline machine. And as we've discussed, uh, this write register signal should be propagated such that uh, you can actually uh, write to the, uh, you use the right des correct destination ID for the register you're writing in the write back stage. Basically, this is a wrong design because it doesn't have that uh, loop back going from, for taking the right register ID or destination register ID and putting it back over here. It's really coming from here over here. So you need to actually design the data path carefully to make this work. But hopefully that's all uh, not so hard. And this is another example of the pipeline control. Basically, it's the same control unit as a single cycle processor, except you delay the control to the proper pipeline stage. It's very similar to what I've shown uh, earlier. OK. Remember then ideal pipeline. Any questions so far? Hopefully this is conceptually sim uh, simple, but uh, we'll, we'll discuss a lot of issues with it. No questions. Good. So remember the ideal pipeline. We want identical operations, independent operations, and uniformly par partitionable sub-operations. And let's, let's analyze the instruction processing. It violates all of them, unfortunately. But we're still going to design pipeline machines. 
We don't have identical operations because we have different instructions and they don't all need the same stages, right? We've just give, seen an example. Forcing different instructions to go through the same pipe stages adds overhead. This is called external fragmentation, if you will. Some pipeline stages are idle for some instructions. Externally to the pipeline stage, you have pipe uh, fragmentation. This pipeline stage is useless at this moment for that instruction. Uniform sub-operations, again, that's also not true. Basically, we have different pipeline stages, but they're not the same latency. They're not uniformly divided. You're not doing work in that pipeline stage all the time, during the entire clock cycle. So you need to force each stage to be controlled by the same clock. And as a result, you get internal fragmentation. Basically, some pipe stages are too fast, but all take the same clock cycle time. So you're wasting part of your clock cycle while you're in that stage. And these both reduce performance to begin with. And the independent operations, it reduces performance at a different level. Basically, instructions are not independent of each other, not always at least. Uh, so you need to detect and resolve these inter-instruction dependencies to ensure the pipeline provides correct results. You cannot ignore dependencies. If this add requires the result of a memory operation, well, you'd, you'd better supply that result. Then this, cause, this causes pipeline stalls. Basically, pipeline is not always moving. Or a pipeline doesn't always have, an inst have a good instruction to execute because you couldn't move the previous instruction needed to wait for a result. So that's called a pipeline stall. So these three issues are very fundamental uh, to a pipeline. And you could uh, extend this analogy to, I'm sure, other things in life. Uh, so I feel free to do that. So issues in pipeline design. Basically, clearly balancing work in different pipeline stages is critical. Basically, all of the issues arise from here. Because it's not an ideal pipeline. So we want to solve them. We want to balance the work in pipeline stages somehow. Now, we're not going to talk about that as much. That's, that's a very tough problem, actually, that people deal with. How many stages and what is done in each stage? We're going to talk about some, uh, some of this over here. You need to, uh, in the presence of events that disrupt the pipeline flow, like dependencies, control and data dependencies. You need to keep the pipeline correct. Correctness is the first. Moving, that's a, an example of correctness. And full, that's a performance issue. You need to do that uh, in the presence of data and control dependencies. And also, there's also a resource contention. What if you have a register file that's needed by, by different stages in the pipeline? This is similar to the dryer example, right? Do you replicate that? Or do you uh, order things? How do you handle long latency operations? And how do you keep the pipeline correct, moving and full, when you have a long latency operation? If the memory takes 500 cycles, how do you keep the pipeline moving? That's going to be very tough with a, uh, with a pi beautiful pipeline design that just looks like what I've shown you. You'll need to do something else to be able to handle that very long latency operation. Handling exceptions and interrupts, this is important. If you get an interrupt, what do you do? Because now we've really broken the von Neumann model internally, right? We're not updating the architectural state, but if you get an interrupt, you need to somehow do something about it, right? You need to ensure that the von Neumann model is not broken. The sequential uh, execution model is not broken. And we'll talk about that. And, of course, improving pipeline throughput by minimizing stalls. That's related to this. So what are the causes of pipeline stalls in the last few minutes? A stall is a condition when the pipeline stops moving. And it could happen for many reasons. It could happen because of resource contention, because a resource is needed by two different stages. It could happen because of dependencies or long latency operations. Let's look at dependencies and their types. This is also called dependency, or some, sometimes it's called a hazard. I really don't like the term hazard because it sounds very dangerous, right? But this is very natural, right? You write programs, and you have dependencies in the programs. In fact, you've got to have them, right? You, you need to output something, and... That's, that thing is dependent on a previous instruction, right? So dependencies dictate ordering requirements between instructions. And if you don't handle them well, that becomes a hazard, of course. The goal is to prevent those hazards so that you're correct. There are two types of dependence, data dependence and control dependence. And resource contention is sometimes called resource dependence, but I don't like that again because it's really not fundamental uh, to the program semantics, so we'll treat it separately. Let's look at resource contention first, treat it separately first. Basically, this happens when instructions in two pipeline stages need the same resource. There are solutions to it. Eliminate the cause of resource contention like we did with the dryer. 
uh, or use separate instruction and data memories, for example, or caches, instead of having a single cache, or make multiple ports in that structure such that you can use the resource concurrently. Uh, or another solution is to detect the resource contention and stall one of the contending stages. Now, this is usually not reliable, but if the resource is not used very often, this may not be bad. I'll give you one example. Uh, basically, uh, when Sun uh, Microsystems designed their first Niagara processor, it was an eight-core processor. It had a single floating point unit shared by all of those eight-core processors. And when one core needed, and when two cores needed that floating point unit, well, they resorted to this solution. One core waited for the other one. That's an example, right? Now, why? Because they didn't want to add floating point units. Now, later, they figured out this is a bottleneck in their design, so Niagara 2 has eight floating point units. <laughs> Interesting how people make decisions uh, over time. But, I mean, it's, uh, they're, they're design points, right? Okay. I guess this is a good place to stop. <laughs> so have a good Easter break, and I'll see you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs>